Hey there nation and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back another episode of Commander Cheapskate Gamer Reviews. This series is dedicated to reviewing different products and materials used in the miniature wargaming hobby. And on today's episode, we are taking a look at Matthias Eliasson's Warhammer Armies project. As you guys are fully aware, we've been reviewing the different army books from Matthias Eliasson's Warhammer Armies project for 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Now, in case you're tuning in for the very first time, what we've been doing is been taking a look at Matthias Eliasson's work for the Warhammer's Army Project. What ended up happening is that after Games Workshop decided to do away with Warhammer setting and the fantasy setting of the old world, uh, moved on to Age of Sigmar, a lot of gamers felt that they wanted to still play Warhammer Fantasy Battle. So Matthias Eliasson created 9th edition rules, which are of course unofficial rules, and that's why they're available for downloading for free from his website. But not only did he make rules for that, but he also made rules for armies and factions that never received army book treatments of their own. So for example, armies like Grand Cathay, for example, which was mentioned quite a bit throughout the lore of Warhammer, but never actually got an army book. He made an army book for those guys. He also made it for the Kingdom of Ind, and in today's episode, also for Norska, which is basically the Scandinavian countries of modern Earth uh, compared to the fantasy setting of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to actually take a look at the Norska Army book. We'll take a look at the Army's rules as well as its bestiary. We'll take a look at its magic and magical items as well as special characters. Take a look at its army lists and then eventually give you our overall conclusion about this product. So with that being said, let's get this video review on a roll. So once again, um, Matthias Eliasson's attention to detail on these books is absolutely fantastic. As you can see, he includes artwork inside of each of the pages. He also does a beautiful job of the scroll work along the borders and such. In fact, if you didn't know any better, you would assume this was actually an official Games Workshop product. I mean, that's how well the desktop publishing is on this product. So with that being said, let's go and talk about exactly what we'll be looking at. Well, first of all, we'll be taking a look at the Norse Warherd. We'll be looking at its army special rule, as well as the bestiary for all the characters. Special characters, magical system, magical artifacts, as well as our army list. We're not going to go too much into detail about the lore of the setting, just because that's not exactly what the purpose of this video is. But just to give you guys some background about Norska, Norska is uh, basically the Scandinavian countries of Earth, uh, only set within the Warhammer Fantasy realm. In fact, a lot of the places and locations in the old world for Warhammer Fantasy is based on real world locations on our world in real life. Now, of course, obviously this is set during the medieval time period for the Norse, so this would have been around the time of the Age of Vikings, uh, the Viking Age, which would have been around, around 900 AD or so in Earth's history. Uh, this is a time period of time when the Norse actually definitely discovered that the rest of Europe actually existed with England, as well as France and other places around the world, so the Vikings, also in the Viking Age, started exploring the region as well. They also did a lot of conquests and also caused a lot of wars in this period of time as well. Now, this book actually takes the mythology and some of the historical characters as well as some of the mythology and legends associated with this culture and actually put it directly into this army list. So if you're wondering what the inspiration is for this army list is, it's medieval Vikings and Norse mythology. It's pretty much what it is. So now that we're done talking about the historical as well as the narrative background of these guys, let's talk about the Norse Warherd. So, oops, I'm sorry. Let's go back over to the next page. I accidentally clicked on the... Uh, Wrong section here. So I guess here we go. The Norse uh, Warherd. So this is basically the army. So let's talk about the army special rules. First of all, we have a army a special rule called Blood Rage. Whenever a model of this special rule makes a successful charge, including counter charge, pursuit, and overrun, they're subject to frenzy in the following round of combat. Which is actually kind of cool because you do get frenzy, which gives you that additional attack in close combat, but at the same time, you're not actually just frenzy either. So you're not, it's kind of like all the benefits with none of the drawbacks of actually having frenzy, which is actually kind of nice. We also have the rule called Fur Cloak. A Fur Cloak gives the natural the wearer natural armor six up save against missile attacks, which is really cool because that natural armor save also stacks against missile attacks, which is really nice as well. And then we have this spell uh, ability called Counter Charge. This is a unit where the majority of the models have this special rule can declare or to use counter charge as a reaction, including frenzy units, if they are charged to the front by an enemy that has more than its movement value away from the Norse unit. Before the enemy roll their charge distance, the Norse unit must take a leadership test. If failed, treat the charge reaction as a hold reaction. If passed, the Norse unit moves 2d3 inches forwards using the random movement special rule, but just stopping within one inch of an enemy unit. They may also use any quick-to-fire weapons they might have before they move. The enemy unit then rolls their charge distance and can 
complete the charge as normal. If the charge is successful, then both units will count as charging in the assuming combat phase. Now that is really cool because counter charging is great for getting that plus one combat resolution for charging. At the same time, you get to fire your quick fire weapons before moving up, which is also really helpful. You also get frenzy because you have blood rage attached to this unit as well. It is just too cool for words as well because that means also that since Norse are really known for close combat, you can get in close combat faster and get that bonus as well and actually close a distance with your enemies which is really really fascinating so that is really cool now from there we have our war leaders which are our kings and our jarls the kings have movement four weapon skill seven blesses skill strength toughness of four three wounds six initiative four attacks nine leadership Jarls, which are the heroes, I imagine, have four movements, six weapon skill, four plus skill strength and toughness, two wounds, five initiative, three attacks, eight leadership. They have the blood rage as well as counter charge rules. So these are your commanders for your armies. We also have seers. We have the Vitki as well as the seer. The Vitki has got movement four, weapon skill three, plus skill three, strength three, four toughness, three wounds, three initiative, one attack, eight leadership. The seer pretty much has the same exact stats except one less wound, one less toughness and one less leadership. These guys have uh, these spells from the Lore of Fire, Lore of Beast, Lore of Heavens, Lore of Shadow, and Lore of Death. So that part is kind of neat as well. It's kind of like your typical wizards. And they can also take Fur Cloaks, which is actually kind of nice. And it only gives them a six of armor save, but you know, it's kind of better than nothing, especially if you're going against shield, uh, shooting, which is kind of nice as well. So from there, of course, we have our Skulls. Skulls are Norse bards, with the R. So behold, the power of epic Nordic rock. Uh, they have movement four, weapon skill four, four ballista skill, four strength and toughness, two wounds, four initiative, two attacks, eight leadership. They have blood rage and counter charge special rule and Skald. A Skald counts as a musician. It may not be the army's general. At the start of the Norse turn, the Skald may choose one of the following songs or tales to tell his unit. Each song can only be used song once per battle by the same Skald, and any unit can only be affected by it once per battle and only once per turn. Each effect lasts at the start of the next Norse turn. We have the Ballad of Three Heroes. All models in the unit gain plus one attack. The Tale of Beowulf. All models in the unit gain the Stubborn and Immunity Psychology Special Rules and the War Chant of Hunlaf. All models in the unit gain plus one to wound and close combat. So that is amazing. It's really useful, I can imagine, against light infantry, against monstrous units, as well as heavy infantry. you got to at least include one, at least in your army. And at the same time, you can take 50 points of magical items with these guys as well. So there is nothing but killer, no filler with these guys. So that part is kind of neat. Then we have our Beast Masters. Uh, beast Masters are moving four, with skill five, plus skill four, strength and toughness of four, two wounds, four initiative, two attacks, eight leadership. They have Blood Rage and Counter Charge and Beast Master. A Beast Master may only join units of War Wolves, Ice Wolves, or Snow Trolls following the rules for mixed units. All War Wolves, Ice Wolves, or Snow Trolls joined by a Beast Master gain the Devastating Charge special rule. However, a Beast Master may never be your army. That is actually kind of cool. I can see this being quite useful. It would mainly depend upon the unit, actually. Actually. I don't see using these guys for war wolves or ice wolves because you just slow them down the move for but for snow trolls that could be useful especially if snow trolls have to worry about things like stupidity for example I could definitely see that being quite useful to have for these guys which would be actually kind of neat to see that taking place so you know that's not so bad actually pretty cool I, I dig it now from there, of course, we have our Bondsmen. Our Bondsmen uh, look like our typical infantry. They have movement four, weapon skill, ballista skill, strength and toughness of three, one wound, three initiative, one attack, seven leadership. Their hearse, or herse, has got one additional attack. They got blood rage and counter charge. So yeah, these look like your typical infantry. Now I do know that you can equip these guys with bows for shooting units or spears for more of a defensive build. And when you combine with light armor and fur cloaks with shields, you get a four up on armor saves, which is actually not bad against shooting attacks. Five up normally against close combat, but four up against shooting, that's pretty good. Considering that you don't have any much shooting units of your own and you're mainly a combat army, that's kind of nice to have that kind of protection. I will admit that. Now from there we have our Marauders. Um, Marauders are uh, movement four, weapon skill four, three sh ballista skill, strength and toughness, one wound, three initiative, one attack, seven leadership. The Yurg, which is the champion, has exact same stats except one additional attack. The infantry of blood rage as well as counter charge. So it looks like these guys are your typical infantry with plus one weapon skill. With shields, light armor, and fur cloaks give you a four up on armor saves from being shot at, five up normally, and can be equipped with great weapons to make them more offensive as well when we get to the army list. So pretty cool, all things considered. Just sure it looks like you're just your general, like Chaos Murder type characters. <clears throat> then we have Reavers. These guys are movement four, weapon skill four, three strength, ballistic skill, strength and toughness, one wound, three initiative, one attack, eight leadership. Helmsman's got the exact same stats except one additional attack. They have ambushers, blood rage, as well as counter charge. 
So these guys are typical infantry as well with plus one weapon skill and one plus one to their leadership, which is kind of nice. And ambushers, which is kind of cool as well. They also get that four up armor save with fur cloaks if you give it to them against shooting attacks. They can also take throwing axes, which is kind of nice. So you can really use those against with counter charge as well. Make a great, uh, great unit to go against a flank or even behind the enemy attacking from the rear. That'd actually be a really good way to do that as well. Then we have our whalers. These guys are movement four. Looks like the same exact stats as a Bondsman. Uh, same thing with the Kraken Slayer, which is their champion, but plus one Ballista skill. They got Blood Rage, Counter Charge, as well as Skirmishers. So that's kind of nice. <clears throat> they do come with Javelins, which is good to use for skirmishing, which is kind of nice. So, you know, using as Chaff units, I use them as Skirmishers to stop enemies from Counter Charging your guys. All things considered, pretty cool. Then we have Thralls. Thralls are your slaves. These are your expendable units. They have movement 4, weapon skill 2, ballistic skill 2, 3 strength and toughness, 1 wound, 3 initiative, 1 attack, 3 leadership. The Slaver, which is their champion. It's typical stats for a, Mara uh, for a Bondsman. They have the expendable the special rule as well as mixed unit. So it looks like you're your typical expendable infantry, useful for tar pitting. They're equipped with slings, which are kind of nice, but it looks like you could take spears or javelins for free with these guys. So in mass, these guys could actually be quite deadly, uh, or at least be good for like protecting a flank or sending them into like bog down an enemy for a tar pit, which is kind of nice. Then we have Norse horsemen. They have uh, movement weapon skill four, three for strength and toughness, and blizzard skill one for wound, three for initiative, one attack. Seven leadership, the horse master gets a plus one to their attack. They have blood rage, counter charge, as well as fast cavalry. So these are your typical fast cab, but they have plus one weapon skill, which is kind of nice, makes it a little bit more survivable. You can also equip the light armor and fur cloaks, giving you a three up on the armor saves, which is fantastic. And they can also be equipped with spears to give them that four up on the charge. They can also take javelins or throwing axes for throwing attacks. Pretty nice, all things considered. It's actually a pretty handy unit to have there. Then we have our house corals. House corals are uh, movement four, weapon skill four, three ballista skill, four strength, three toughness, one wound, four initiative, one attack, eight leadership. The herser, which is their champion, has one additional attack. They got blood rage, counter charge, as well as stubborn special rules, which is cool. Then we have this special rule called shield wall. All models of this special rule gain a plus one to their armor save against missile attacks to their front and sides from their shield. So that part is kind of nice. Weapon skill 4, bliss strength 4, leadership 8, those are really nice. Having that plus 1 armor saving as shooting attacks is also really cool too. You can upgrade these guys in medium armor and fur cloaks and so make them, what is it, that's uh, 5, 4, 3 up against shooting attacks, 4 against normal, plus great weapons for extra, you know, smash and bash. Not bad at all, that's actually quite cool. Now from there we have our Berserkers, they're movement 4, weapon skill 4, 3 strength, bliss skill, 4 strength, 4 toughness, kind of nice. One wound, four initiative, one attack, eight leadership. The shield biter has one additional attack. They have counter charge, devastating attack, as well as frenzy. So they have frenzy, but they can still counter charge, which is kind of cool too, so they can still do that. They also got that four up toughness, which is really nice as well. Plus one for attacks for devastating charge. Makes these guys have what? Base attack is two attacks, plus frenzy gives them three attacks apiece. Pretty nice. They can also take great weapons, and they can also become skirmishers, which is really cool too. I say keep them in really small units for flanking reinforcements, but otherwise, they don't have any armor upgrades for them, so I would say skip on that one, just because they're not as survivable. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to shoot these guys off with any kind of uh, strength for weapon they can get their hands on, so that part's kind of, kind of hard. Then we have our Hunters, um, Movement 4, Weapon Skill 4, Ballistic Skill 4, kind of cool. 3 Strength and Toughness, 1 Wound, 4 Initiative, 1 Attack, 7 Leadership. They got Blood Rage, Counter Charge, Skirmishers, as well as Scouts. That Stubborn, I mean, the, the, sorry, not the Stubborn, the Skirmishing, Shooting Infantry with Weapon Skill 4, Ballistic Skill 4, that is kind of nice. These guys would be perfect for War Machine Hunting. You might want to upgrade them with additional hand weapons and give them the additional attacks, but that's really about it. Keep them really small. Units of 5 to 10 guys. Have them pop up attack enemy war machines. This is perfect for these guys. So from there we have Shield Maidens. Shield Maidens have movement 4, weapon skill 4, ballista skill 4, 3 strength and toughness, 1 wound, 4 initiative, 1 attack, 7 leadership. The Shield Sister has 1 additional attack. They have Blood Rage and Counter Charge and Shield Parry. Shield Maidens may be rolled failed parry saves as well. That is kind of nice. However, though, you can only give them a 4-up armor. They can take Javelin, which is kind of cool too, but they have no strength bonuses to their normal melee attacks, which only makes them strength 3. So that's kind of rough. Even though it does sound cool, and even though mythologically they're very cool too, because Shield Maidens were actually women in Norse, in, in Norse culture who actually were tasked with protecting priestesses and such. And that was their whole point of doing so. They were training combat. But even though it's stylistically very cool, I would say skip, though, just because they don't have any strength bonuses. So... That part's kind of rough. 
Then of course we have the Valkyrie real quick. Uh, so this is a character. It's got movement 4, 5 weapon skill, 4 ballistic skill, 4 strength and toughness, 2 wounds, 5 initiative, 3 attacks, 9 leadership. Uh, they have counter charge, they have fly 10 inches, immunity to psychology, messenger of the gods. A Valkyrie counts as having in the inspiring presence ability the range of 6 inches. So flying infantry character who's immune to psychology, she can also give inspiring present a leadership nine is pretty good, especially for reinforcing a, an exposed flank, for example, or a flank that's about to collapse. That part's kind of nice. She could also take 50 points of magical items as well, so I would say this is an auto-include, just because you could send her into a place to actually uh, shore up any psychology or leadership that you might need on the battlefield, which is actually really, really nice. I'm not going to lie about that. That's pretty good. Then from there we have the Wolfenar, which is a uh, movement 7, weapon skill 5, 4 strength and toughness, 1 wound, 5 initiative, 2 attacks, 7 leadership. The Werekin uh, has a 1 additional attack. These are war beasts. They have counter charge, they cause fear, which is nice. Frenzy as well, so that gives them, what, 3 attacks? Regeneration 5 up. That causing fear can be good, especially for flank and enemy. And they can be skirmishers, but at 16 points apiece. They're a little expensive for what they can do. I would highly recommend you take Skin Wolves instead of these guys. Which is interesting because we're going to talk about those next. So Skin Wolves. So Skin Wolves are movement 7, 5 weapon skills, 0 bliss skill, 4 strength and toughness, 3 wounds, 5 initiative, 3 attacks, 7 leadership. They are monstrous beasts with counter charge, frenzy, and regeneration save of 5 up. They are fast with frenzy, with movement 7, which is kind of nice. They're also toughness 4, which is useful. But, you know, if you try to send them against anything head on, they're going to get slaughtered. But... That is why flanks exist, so send your skin wolves to the flank and that would be really, really cool as well. And then we have the Ulfjarls, which are the character version of these guys. They have 7 movements, 6 weapon skill, 0 ballistic skill, 5 strength and toughness, 4 wounds, 5 initiative, 4 attacks, 8 leadership. They have counter charge frenzy and they have the hidden special rule as Rirel's region 5. They can also take a talisman up to 50 points, which is kind of cool too. What makes them amazing though, in my opinion, is the fact that they have that hidden special rule, which is perfect perfect for character assassinations so you get this guy inside of a unit that's gonna be charged by one of your enemies that has a really powerful character to have this guy pop out at him and start attacking him that would be fantastic to see that actually happen then out there we have were beasts uh were beasts are a monster actually it's one of our first monster units that we actually have it's got movement seven weapon skill four zero ballista skill five strength and five toughness four wounds four initiative four attacks six leadership it is a monster with frenzy so it's gonna have five uh, attacks base hatred so it can re-roll any missed attacks regeneration five up as well as unbreakable unbreakable is actually quite potent now it says for the purposes of calculating combat result bonuses a rare beast counts having no flanks or rear so it cannot be overran or uh, disrupted which is actually really powerful as well and at the same time you can get upgrades you can get knitted flesh which means it gives a four up region save scaly high giving a five up armor save snarling fangs which gives a multiple wounds d3 or steel hard claws giving an armor piercing one this thing is a monster. A close combat beast, unbreakable, makes it really, really attractive as well. Really useful for tying up and protecting your flanks, I would say. And at 208 points for this thing with all the upgrades, that is not bad, actually. Um, granted, it's dependent upon the situation you plan on using this thing, but to protect one of your flanks with unbreakable, really, really cool. I cannot say anything bad about this. This is actually kind of nice. Then we have our wolves. We have our war wolf, which is movement nine, three weapon skills, zero ballistic skill, three strength and toughness, one wound, three initiative, one attack, five leadership. It's your typical war beast, so just your good old fashioned chaff unit. Take a couple of them to march block as well as to stop uh, fanatics and such. We also have our wolf chariots. Uh, chariots got movement eight. 5 strength, 4 toughness, 4 wounds. You got Marauder crew with 1 plus 1 to their weapon skill. They have 2 werewolves. They have armor save of 6. They have blood rage and counter charge as well. So their chariots with blood rage and counter charge, which are maybe might make them the best light chariots ever. Having that frenzy giving you two att 4 attacks with your crew would be really, really cool as well. At the same time, closing that distance with that chariot for those impact hits would be really cool as well. You equip these guys with light armor, shields, and fur cloaks, give you a three up armor saving and shooting, four up against normal attacks, which is really nice as well. But the only thing I can say about them, they can only be taken in units of one, which is not so great. If you could put them in units of three, I think that'd be really cool, but just by themselves, eh, it, it'd kind of be kind of dependent, I guess. And then we have Ice Wolves next. Ice Wolves have 9 of movement, 4 weapon skills, 0 ballistic skill, 5 strength, 4 toughness, 3 wounds, 
Four leadership, three attacks, six leadership, and they also have ice attacks as well. So, good flanking unit in my opinion. Very, very quick. Good strength. That ice attacks also makes them very attractive because it gives your enemy always strike last. I say this would have to be an auto include. Those ice wolves would be really cool. And in fact, you could actually use some Rusian wolves from Warner 40k to actually make these guys because they're a little bit bigger than your typical wolf. So, very, very cool. I like those a lot. Then we have Snow Trolls. So let's talk about these guys real quick. Movement 6, Weapon Skill 3, 1 Blizzle Skill, 5 Strength, 4 Toughness, 3 Wounds, 2 Initiative, 3 Attacks, 6 Leadership, Monstrous Infantry, they have Armor Piercing 1, Frenzy, so they can have 4 Attacks base, 4 Region, and they also have Stupidity, but they also have Frost Breath as well. Instead of attacking normally, the whole unit can choose to breathe ice on the enemy. Each model infect inflicts 1 automatic Strength 4 hit with the Ignore's Armor Save and Ice Attack Special Rule distributed as hits from shooting. I can definitely see this being quite useful to put Always Strike last with those Ice Attacks. That would be pretty cool. They also have Frenzy as well. So they're typical that they're trolls because they have stupidity, so that's not so great. Um, it takes looks like it's going to cost you 135 points for three of these guys. So I say take them. They'll be good for defending an open flank. And their movement six. Now I know that the Beastmaster is only movement four. So eight inches moving with marching. Keep them alongside a flank of your infantry units. I say it'd be a good investment to have. Just because that six up leadership for stupidity is really going to hurt you. So unless you're putting them near your general or maybe a Valkyrie. Actually, if you put a Valkyrie these guys, they would have leadership nine. You know what? Forget the Beastmaster. Take the Valkyrie, have her pair up with these dudes. That would be really cool to see that, actually. That'd be a really cool, uh, actually cool uh, combination there. So very, very cool. And then we have Frost Giants, the good old Frost Giants. Oh yeah, these guys are cool. So these are like a that's like a Dungeons and Dragons um, staple, the blue skin giants. But the cool thing about these guys is that they actually wear armor and actually carry weapons in the lore. So your Frost Giant, movement six, weapon skill four, three ballistic skills, six strength and toughness and wounds, three initiative, five attacks, ten leadership. They're a monster. They have ice attacks, which is great because gives the enemies always strike last. They have stubborn, which is awesome as well. Never going to be breaking because of that 10-up leadership. And they're also immune to psychology as well. Stubborn monster with ice attacks, leadership 10. A rare creature indeed. And it can also take medium armor and shields for 4-up armor save. And it can take a great weapon, making a strength 8. Okay, that's an auto-include. I don't care what you have to do. Get yourself a frost giant in your army because that thing is beast mode. Then we have a Cursed Etten. Oh, the Cursed Etten, the horrible two-headed monsters. Uh, they got movement six, four weapon skill, three ballista skill, six strength and toughness and wounds, two initiative, five attack, seven leadership. They're also a monster with stubborn. That is kind of cool too, so pretty cool thing about that. They got regeneration five up. And they have upgrades as well. So let's talk about this real quick. So Bitter Cruelty. When the Cursed Etten charged an enemy unit in the rank, uh, flank or rear, the bonus to his combat resolution is doubled, so... That's going to make you want to automatically flank with this thing. It's also got a hammer hand. The hammer hand is an additional attack that is resolved at strength 8 with heroic killing blow special rule. Good gravy, that is beast. And two-headed. Choose which personality the Cursed Etten to be in control at the start of the game. At the end of any phase in which the Cursed Etten was a suffered a wound and must take a leadership test. If passed, the Cursed Etten retains its former cur its current personality. If failed, the other takes over. The effects of the two superheads are as follows. We have the Betrayer. The Cursed Etten has Hatred and Bitter Cruelty special rule. Very cool. And then we have the Savage. The Cursed Etten has plus one strength, minus one weapon skill, minus one leadership, but it has Frenzy. That is pretty devastating as well. Not going to lie. Pretty cool with that. It looks like we have upgrades for this one. One's called Gibberer. Uh, all enemies within 8 inches of the Cursed Etten suffer minus 1 to leadership. This has no effect on models of immunity to psychology. Pretty nice. Kind of like freaking out your enemy, which is kind of neat. It's got Scaled Horror, which is another one. Cursed Etten gains natural armor 4 up special rule. In addition, whenever it suffers an unsaved wound in close combat, the unit which inflicted the wound suffers D6 strength 2 hits with poison attack special rule. That's kind of neat too. Then we have Man Scyther. Says the curse and loses the hammer hand special rule, but gains impact D6 plus one special rule and plus one attack. I don't know. Heroic killing blow at strength eight. Replacing with this. I don't know. I guess if you're using it against light infantry, that'd be kind of cool. It's an upgrade, but I think the hammer hand is actually much more useful. And then we have Rune Caller. The curse and loses the hammer hand special ability rule, but becomes a level one wizard that uses spell from Lord of Beast, Shadow, or Death. Should the curse and miscast, her personality will automatically shift with no leadership test required. So, I don't know though. That heroic killing blow is hard to beat with the rune collar. 
I don't know, it's a, it seems like it's a really cool monster. I would suggest upgrading it with the Gibberer or with Scaled Horror. Scaled Horror and Gibberer seem like the most useful ones in my opinion. Destruction of enemy leadership is also kind of nice, but it's also kind of dependent as well uh, if you can get in the flank as such. Still, I would make it an automatic include for me, but you know, if you don't have the points, I can see why you might skip it. So, you know, but still, Heroic Killing Blow though, that, that makes it super attractive in my opinion. <laughs> Then we have Ice Drakes. These are Ice Dragons. With movement 6, 5 weapon skill, 0 ballistic skill, 5 strength and toughness and wounds, 4 initiative, 4 attacks, 7 leadership. That 4 initiative is kind of nice, actually. I'm not going to lie. Most dragons are slow as, as all get out, but initiative 4 is really cool. It's a monster that can also fly 8 inches. It's got ice attacks, so obviously that always strikes last for your enemies. Natural armor 4 up. That's not bad. It's also got ice breath. Ice breath is a breath weapon attack. Hits a result at strength 4, which ignores armor saves. And ice attack special rule. Any hits are distributed as hits from shooting. That is cool. An ice breathing dragon at 200 points. That is not bad. 200 points for Ice Breathing Dragon. Um, that would be hard to pass up. But the problem I'm seeing though is you got some really cool rare choices. You got Frost Giants, Cursed Ettons, Were Beasts, Ice Dragon. This army might be a very army, uh, very monster heavy army. It might be like a Monster Mash army because all these rare choices sound amazing so far. And then we have the War Mammoth, the classic holdover from the Forge World of Old. Back in the day, Forge World actually made these huge War Mammoths that you could actually use for your Chaos Norse armies. So let's talk about it real quick. It's got 8 movement, 3 weapon skills, 0 ballistic skills, 7 strength, 6 toughness, 10 wounds, 1 initiative, special attacks, leadership 5, Marauder crew with plus 1 weapon skills, so that part is kind of nice. It's also got immediate psychology, impact, hits a d6 plus 1 at strength 7, it's pretty ter 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 uh, terrifying. Large target, it's also got natural armor of 5 up. The mammoth attack looks like it's looks like it's pretty much like uh, the giants looks like. So trample, stomp, bellow, pick up, and whatever. It's got gore, uh, butt, gore, and bellow. So it looks like if you trample somebody, it's D3 strength 7 hits for each rank of 5 or more models the unit has. Pretty cool. Bellow. The mammoth trumpets and roars with deafening force. Neither the mammoth nor any unit in contact with it may fight. The mammoth automatically wins a combat by 3 points or more. The result has no effect against MA constructs. That's kind of nice. Yeah, that's really cool there. But the uh, the moment uh, mammoth charges, ramming its victim with his massive head, the mammoth inflicts one automatic hit against one model in base contact. Your choice, causing D3 strength seven hits with multiple wounds D3. That would be brutal against characters. It causes D uh, three D6 hits with its stomp attack. Very very nice there. We have gore. The mammoth gouges the enemy with its massive tusks. Makes D6 attacks against a chosen unit in close combat with Heroic Killing Blow. Oh my goodness, Heroic Killing Blow against monsters. Oh, good goodness, that, that would be awesome. And then we have Pick Up and Throw into Combat, Hurl, Eat, Squash, and Grab Another. Those are, you know, typical giant attacks as well. Now, at 325 points with five Marauder Crewmen armed with Javelins, you can also use a mount for a king as well. A little pricey. But Heroic Killing Blow for big monsters? I don't know. It's kind of cool. I don't know. 325 points is quite pricey. But, you know, for a character mount, though, that is kind of neat as well. Not going to lie, these are actually pretty cool, all things considered. All right. Uh, I, I dig it. I dig it a lot. So now that we're done talking about the bestiary real quick, we're going to stop here, and then we'll come back real quick to talk about the special characters for the Norska army. We'll be right back. All right, so now we're back with the special characters for this army with Eric Redax, High King of the Norse. I believe he's supposed to be based off of Eric the Red, the explorer, who actually found, you know, the uh, Iceland, Greenland, and the New World, those guys. So Eric Redax, he's got movement 4, weapon skill 7, bliss skill 4, strength and toughness of 4, 3 wounds, 6 initiative, 5 attacks, 10 leadership. He's got Blood Rage as well as Counter Charge, which is nice. He's got Saga the Eternal Warrior, which is kind of nice there, as well as Saga the Fearless Leader. Saga the Fearless Leader is nice. It gives you 3d6 uh, for your leadership test, so you take away the highest die roll. Eternal Warrior, that one is kind of nice as well. It says Invocation of Thunder. Once per game at the beginning of any of your turns, Eric may call upon the Invocation of thunder the effects of the invocation last to the start of the next norse turn all missile fire during this time suffers minus one to hit one enemy unit from your choice suffers d6 strength four hits with armor which ignores armor saves very cool man bring down the thunder he's also got the magic weapon battle troll it says uh, attacks from this weapon ignores armor saves in addition it gives eric a four board save that's all he asks just that that's it 
okay i would to see what it, i would have to see what his point value is uh to see if he's worth it or not but that's it four up armor set four up board save and north armor armor saves he's only strength four though uh oh well then we have sturm jarl shaman of east guard so he's got movement four weapon skill five list skill three four strength and four toughness three wounds uh well five weapon skill he's also got oh two attacks five initiative eight leadership He's a special character. Uh, Storm Jarl is a level 4 wizard who uses the spells and lore of Heavens or Lore of Shadow. Kind of nice there. He's got Hymns of Malice. If Storm Jarl is a unit of, with the Blood Rage rule, then the unit is subject to hatred. Ooh, that's kind of nice. We have the Staff of Storms. Storm Jarl and any unit he joins are treated as if in soft cover. Very cool. In addition, whenever Storm Jarl casts a Magic's Missile spell, he may reroll the number of hits caused by the spell. That is kind of neat. I like that. Then we have gifts of Tichar, which is basically Zneech, uh, for those of you guys who don't know. That's what the uh, that's what the uh, um, Norse call him. It says every time Storm Yarl casts a spell, he may use one additional free power dice. If you roll the one on this dice, Storm Yarl is overcome by mischievous schemes of Tichar and must immediately pass leadership tests or suffer a miscast. At leadership eight, that's a pretty good gamble. And he's got East Guard Ruins, Arcane Item. Storm Yarl may reroll one failed attempt to dispel a spell once per magic phase. That is pretty cool. Okay, I would say Sturm Jarl is definitely, definitely worth it from what I'm seeing here. Giving your guys hatred, giving your guys soft cover, being able to get additional power die on spells, able to attempt to dispel a, st a spell again that you failed once per magic phase. These are all very powerful abilities. I would say yes, definitely take Sturm Jarl on your arm if you need to. He's got perfect magical abilities. Lore of Shadow, Lore of Heavens. I would say it'd be kind of dependent. I could see where Laura Shadow could be really help. I would say take Laura Shadow because you get that automatic die to help you out. So you only got a one six chance of rolling a one, so you can get those spells off uh, easier. I say take Storm Mural. Very deadly dude. Then we have Qrl the Thunderhand, the Dragon Slayer. <clears throat> He's got movement four, weapon skill seven, four ballistic skill, strength and toughness, three wounds, six initiative, four attacks, nine leadership. He's infantry character with Blood Rage, Counter Charge, and Saga the Beast Slayer, which means he could get rerolls on hits and wounds against his targets. He's got Dragon Slayer, which is a magic weapon. Gives his wielder plus three strength, so he strength seven. That's nice. And multiple wounds, D3. Very nice. And when used against dragons, it wounds on a two up. Very nice. And has the multiple wounds, D6 special rule. Even better. In addition, it may cause fear against dragons if they are normally immune to it. That is pretty cool. I, I dig that. Four strength, seven attacks that so causes D3 wounds normally or two up on a, and causes D6 wounds on dragon specifically. Very, very cool. And he's got Torgrim Circulate, which is a uh, talisman. Carol, uh, Ke Carol gains immunity to flaming attacks. Nice. In addition, due to the reflecting qualities of the circlet, any model targeting Cor uh, Carol or the unit he is joined with with a flaming attack must roll a D6 for each hit. On a four plus, the hit is instead reflected back onto the attacker. That's kind of nice, because there is a lot, a lot of flaming attacks out there, so very cool. I wanted to see how much Carol Thunderhand actually costs and points to see if he's worth it, but very cool so far. I like two of these characters. Okay, so who cares if the king is not that great? You got two other characters that are actually pretty cool. Then we have Fenrir Wolfclaw, the Shackled King, first amongst the Werekin. Okay, so this guy must be the Ulfenar uh, special character then. He's got movement 7, weapon skill 7, 0 ballista skill, 5 strength, 5 toughness, 4 wounds, 6 initiative, 5 attacks, 9 leadership. He's a special character, Monstrous Beast. He's got counter charge, frenzy, and regeneration 5 up. King of the Wolfkin, if Fenrir is your army general, very cool. Ulfwernar counts as core units instead of special units. Ooh, that's kind of scary. In addition, all friendly units of Wolfwernar and skin wolves within 12 inches of Fenrir may reroll their charges results, including counter charges. That is kind of cool. Tormented Mind, at the start of each of your turns, Fenrir must take a leadership test. Leadership 9, not so bad. If passed, Fenrir maintains control of his mind, acts as normal this turn. If failed, he can automatically fill any Berserk Rage test he's required to make this turn. But it may reroll items. Uh, it may also reroll all filled rolls to hit in close combat as well. And then we have Runic Shackles, which is a talisman. The Runic Shackles grant Fen Fenrir a ward save of 6 plus and the magic resistance 2 up special rule. This is kind of neat. I could see you, like, if you're really big and using the Wolfenar, Wolfenar, as well as the Skin Wolves in your army, this could be a very specific, like, very wolf like army build. I could definitely see you using this special character to do that as well. And that wouldn't be all that bad. That actually would be kind of cool. Hmm. I'll have to think about that one real quick. 
All right, so now we move on to Drenok Johansson, the wielder of the Great Axe. So let's talk about this character. He's got movement 4, 6 weapon skill, 4 ballistic skill, 4 strength and toughness, 2 wounds, 5 initiative, 3 attacks, 8 leadership. Special character, it looks like a hero character. He's got uh, Blood Rage, Counter Charge, as well as Saga of the Relentless Warrior, which makes him have more attacks. He's got the Ice Fang Axe, which is a magic weapon. It's a great weapon. The Ice Fang Axe gives Drenok the armor piercing 1 and multiple wounds D3 special rule. And he's got the Saber Tusk Tiger Hide, which is magic armor. It's a fur cloak, so it's going to give him that one up armor saving and shooting attacks, which is really cool. And the Saber Tusk Hide gives the wearer the Fear special rule. I don't know about this guy. I would have to see what his point values were worth. I know he's going to be probably a hero character, so I would see what his point value is. I don't know. D3 wounds is kind of nice, but fear. I don't. Uh, I'll have to see what his point value is to see if he's actually worth it. Then we have Floki Lawson, peerless adventurer, descendant of Los, uh, Loster, uh, Loster Eric, Lost Ericsson. So, okay, so this guy looks like he's based on Floki Larson. Uh, Floki Larson was actually uh, the guy who actually discovered uh, Iceland. He's also one of the guys, I believe, he also invented the Viking warship that everyone knows about. I think he's the guy who actually kind of made that thing as well. Uh, played, I believe, he, I believe his character was also in the TV series Vikings on History Channel, I believe. So let's talk about this guy. He's got Floki Larson, four movements, six weapon skill, four ballistic skill, strength, and toughness. Two wounds, five initiative, three attacks, eight leadership. He's riding something called Sharp Tooth, which is movement seven, weapon skill three, zero ballistic skill, four strength and toughness, one wound, two, oh, two initiative, two attack, three leadership. So what is this? Oh, okay. He's riding... Okay, I get it now. He's riding a cold one, is what he's riding. Oh, so this guy's riding a cold one because he made it all the way to Lustria. Okay, he's got Blood Rage, Counter Charge, Fear, Natural Armor, Six Up, and Stupidity. Okay, I see it now. He's riding a... Uh, that's kind of cool. Character riding a... Uh, Cold one. He's got the fearless special rule. Loki, if Loki lost son and any unit joins, may reroll psychology tests. Very cool. The war herd of Skeggy. Your, if your army contains Floki Lost Sun, you may upgrade one unit of Norse horsemen to Norse Colwyn riders. Very cool. Gain the fear, natural armor, six up and stupidity special rules. This unit counts as a special choice as the following profile. So it looks like you got your typical rider with a better stats with plus one weapon skill, riding a cold one, which is kind of nice. He's got the Obsidian Axe, which is a magic item. Great weapon. I think it would be a magic weapon, actually. It's got a great weapon. All attacks made with this weapon has the Ignore's Armor Save special rule. Very cool. Old Bloody Cloak, which is magic armor. Fur Cloak, so he gets that one up against armor saves. He's got models from the Warhammer Lizardmen are subject to hatred when fighting against Floki and any unit he joined. Whenever Floki rolls a 6 to a hit in close combat, he immediately makes another attack. Roll to hit and wound as normal. Attacks generated this way do not generate further attacks. Okay, so it's kind of a double-edged sword right there. Then we have the Gilded Trinket, which is a talisman. The Gilded Trinket grants Floki a ward save of 5+. In addition, he and any unit he joins has the Forest Strider special rule. Very cool to use against for Calvary, because Calvary usually has all kinds of problems in the forest. Plus, you get Colwyn Riders. Pretty cool. I will have to see exactly what this guy's uh, point cost would be and what the coal point cost of the Cold Riders would be. But this seems like a very cool character to have. Very, very cool. Then we have Braggy Sterlinson, the Ever Scald, Poet of Legends. So this is like the rock star of the Scalds, I guess. He's got movement 4, open skill 4, blitz skill 4, strength and toughness of 4, 2 wounds, 4 initiative, 2 attacks, 8 leadership, blood rage, counter charge, and he's also got the Scald. He's got the Rune Edge Tongue. Magical Tongue. Any <laughs> any Scald song sung by Braggy affects all friendly units within 8 inches of him rather than just his unit. That is pretty cool. He's got the Lore Weaver's Harp, which is a magic weapon. The Lore Weaver's Harp fires a mass as a weapon with the following profile 18 inches, Frank 4, and Nord's Armor saves multiple shots D6 and quick to fire. Behold the power of rock. And now comes lightning bolts, I guess. That is kind of cool too. Uh, the idea of him actually being affecting all units within 8 inches, that is quite attractive um i have to see what his point values is to see if he's actually worth it but very cool so far i'm liking all the special characters i'm seeing so far it's kind of like hard to choose which one's the cool one then we have sigrun the proud the defiant she who stands firm so looks like it's a female leader she's got weapon uh, movement four weapon skill six plus skill strength and toughness of four two wounds six initiative three attacks eight leadership she's got blood rage counter charge the saga of the ever vigilant which is i believe the leader was the with the three up no that's the ever-vigilant uh, ever leader. I gotta take a look at the uh, rules for that one. She also has Shield Parry as well. She's Defiant. Sigrun, uh, Sigrun and any unit of Shield Maidens that she joins has a Sever Special Rule. Okay, I might have to skip this one then, because the 
The shield maidens didn't look very good. Shield bash. For every successful parry save made by Sigrun, she merely makes an additional attack back against the model that struck the blow. This attack does not benefit from the effects of her weapon. She has Eagle's Talon, which is a magic weapon. Eagle's Talon gives Sigrun the flaming attacks and strength bonus 2 special rule. Bigger strength 6, not bad. And Valkmira, Protector Shield, Magic Armor. Any models targeting Sigrun in close combat or with missile attacks must be rolled successful rolls to hit. So, very cool there. I can see taking her just by herself, but not Shield Maiden. Shield Maidens didn't look very good when I was looking at them last. But we'll take a look when we take a look at the army list real quick. So, pretty cool. Then we have Njal Trollson, the Strider, the Savage Hunter. So it looks like he's a hunter special character. Movement 4, Y weapon skill, 6 plus a skill, 4 strength and toughness, 2 wounds, 5 initiative, 3 attacks, 8 leadership. He's got Blood Rage, Counter Charge, Hatred of the Empire, Saga of the Glorious Hunter, Scouts, as well as Sniper Special Rule. Ooh, this guy might be a character sniper. He's got Steel Bane, Longbow, attacks made with a Steel Bane result at Strength 4 with Killing Blow Special Rule. That's not bad. Scrimshaw Talisman grants Nyel a ward save of 5 up and enemy missile attacks targeting him or his unit suffer minus 1 to hit. I can see pairing this guy with a unit of hunters. That would actually be a very good choice, I think. Just for that ability to character snipe your enemies, like necromancers would be really good, generals, magic users. That could be really neat. The plus that you can also scout as well. He's got that sniper special rule. That's very, very attractive with his rules. Very cool. I like that look. Then we have Jora and Bjorn, the Maiden and the Bear. The Bear, the Bear, and the Maiden Fair. Anyway, so it looks like that's the legend that's coming up with this one. Looks like they're uh, companions, a magical bear monster, and a woman who joins them. So Jora, she's got uh, four movement, five weapon skill, four ballista skill, four strength and toughness, two wounds. She's got five initiative, three attacks, eight leadership. Bjorn, the Bear, has got six wounds, six weapon skills, zero ballista skill, five strength and toughness, four wounds, five initiative, four attacks, eight leadership. Infantry special character and monsters beast special character. They have blood rage counter charge, and they're also skirmishers, a regeneration of four up for Bjorn only. Deep Bond, Yora and Bjorn must always be in the same unit if they join one. As long as both Yora and Bjorn are alive, they have immunity to psychology. Roll a d6 for each hit Yora suffers. On a 4+, plus, Bjorn steps in to protect her, resolve the hit against him instead. If Yora is slain, Bjorn becomes frenzied and unbreakable. If Yora is slain, then Yora becomes unbreakable and hates the unit that killed him. That's kind of a nice little unit buff right there. Having unbreakable in case Yora dies is very, very nice. Or, or if Bjorn dies, that's kind of nice. Having being unbreakable, that would be really cool to have. And plus giving hatred as well. And that unit will also have immunity to psychology. That is really cool. Very, very cool there. It looks like we have the Baron, uh, Baron Sunling uh, Broadsword. That's a mouthful. Baron Sunling Broadsword. Just call it the Baron Lung Sing Sword. Oh, well, I don't know. Anyways, a magic weapon. Great weapon. Oh, cool. So it looks like it gives... Uh, strength 6 to Yora. Very neat there. Each successful hit with this weapon is multiplied to 2 hits. Ooh, so she can possibly get 6 strength 6 hits. Yeah, that is pretty brutal. I gotta see what their point values are, but this might be an auto-include as well. Very, very cool. Then we have the Raven's Veert, which is the Chosen of the Gods. Looks like he's a champion for the Norse Gods. He's got movement 4, weapon skill 7, bliss skill 5, 4 strength and toughness, 2 wounds, 6 initiative, 3 attacks, and 10 leadership. He's got the Ambushers, Blood Rage, Counter Charge, and Unbreakable special rule. Very cool. Loner, the Raven's Weir may never be the army's general. He may not join any... Okay, less cool. May not join any unit. That's not as cool. He's got the Ravens. Each of the two ravens gives the raven weird an additional attack that resolves that weapon skill 3, strength 3. These attacks do not benefit from any bonuses or magical weapons. If the raven's weird is wounded, roll a d6 for each wound suffered. On a 2 up, the raven's weird may ignore the wound and reduce the strength and toughness or attacks by 1 instead. Not so great. On a 1, one of his ravens are slain instead. If both ravens are killed, then the raven's weird will also die and is removed from the table. Uh. In addition, a roll of d6 at the beginning of the Norse turn. On a roll of 6, the Raven's Weird may increase his strength, toughness, or attacks by 1. This increase may not take it above the Raven's Weird starting character. Oh, okay, so then why have it? Okay, so I can just tell you right now, I'm not going to take this guy. Anyways, we have Graham and Balmung. These are two weapons. Two hand weapons. Graham gives the Raven's Weird the Always Strike first special rule, and Balmung gives him strength bonus 1, so strength 5. And our piercing 1 special rule. And the Helm of the Norns. Plus 6 armor save. Any missile attacks targeting Raven's weird suffer minus 1 to hit. Okay, this whole Raven's thing is kind of a weird game mechanic. I don't get it. So, I would suggest skipping this guy. 
Okay, so we got two bad characters. The King, as well as the Ravens, we're not so great. But everyone else is amazing. I would have a really hard time of actually picking what character I would take. I would have to look at their their uh, their bonus points to see exactly how much those guys cost or to see if I would take them or not. So now that we're going to talk about the special character... Oh, no, I'm sorry, we have more. We have Stearmere, Stearmere Rhyme Frost, King of the Frost Giants. So it looks like we have a Frost Giant special character. He's got movement 6, weapon skill 6, 3 ballista skills, 7 strength... Nice. Six toughness, seven wounds, three initiatives, six attacks, ten leadership. I'm loving his stats. Monster, special character, ice breath, immunity, psychology, and stubborn. He's got the weapon Rick's Brand, which is a magic weapon. It's a great weapon. Wow. That gives him strength nine in close combat. Six strength, nine attacks. Rick's Brand gives Stamir their heroic killing blow and ice attack special roll. Oh my goodness. Heroic killing blow is a beast. As well as ice attacks, so your opponent has always strike last. Even better, he's also got glacier plates, which are magic armor, heavy armor. The glacier plates give Stimir a ward for ward up save of four plus against all missile attacks and immunity to ice attacks as well. Stopping a cannon at four up—that is no joke. I wonder if this guy. Yeah, it doesn't look like it says he can't be a general, so you could actually have this guy be the general of your army. That'd be one hell of a general to go up against. And he's immune to psychology with stubborn. And he's got ice breath too. Oof, that is really cool. Okay, so two bad characters so far. Everybody else, pretty amazing. Uh, that would be a hard one to choose for me. I would have to admit, that would be very, very difficult. Okay, so now that we're done with the magic, uh, the, the uh, special characters, we'll come back here in a second to talk about magic and magical items. Right, so we're going to talk about magic as well as magic items. The first we're going to start off is with what's known as sagas. It says, The sagas of the Norse chronicle their history and their lore. It says, Unlike most other races, they preserve their past or oral tradition rather than written form by the tribe skalds. These sagas we tell stories of great feats, tributing to great Norsemen with those past. Yada, yada, yada. Certain characters in the Norse army can choose one of the sagas on this page as detailed in the army list. No saga may be taken more than once per army, not including special characters. So Saga, the fearless leader for 35 points, the character in the unit they are with will roll 3d6 for all leadership tests and discard the highest result. That one is an automatic include. Having that 3d6 and taking away the highest die roll is always a good thing to have. Always take this one if you can. Then we have Saga, the ever vigilant for 30 points. Model on foot with shield only. The character gains the parry 6 plus special rule. And enemies suffer minus 1 to hit in close combat. That is pretty nice. For 30 points, that's pretty cool. Then we have Saga the Relentless Warrior for 30 points. The character gains plus 1 attack for every enemy model and base contact with them. One is their turn to strike up to a max of 3 plus. Eh, I could say take or leave this one. Not really necessary. These two though, pretty cool. This one, definitely. Saga the Fierce Leader, always take that one. Saga of the Shining Hero for 25 points. The model gains the Inspiring Presence ability with a 6 inch range. If this is taken by the Army General, their Inspiring Presence ability range is increased by 6 inches. 25 points is not bad to have that. I would say give this to somebody like, uh, maybe like a character with a higher leadership, like maybe like a, like a, a Jarl, like a hero level character. That could really help out maybe. We have Saga the Beast Slayer for 20 points. The model gains immunity to terror. Kind of nice. In addition, they gain plus one to hit and to wound when fighting more beasts, monstrous beasts, or monsters in close combat. I can see taking this for a character who's mounted on a monster, for example, or monstrous beasts to fight with. I could definitely see that. Like for a leader mounted on a war mammoth, for example, that could be really helpful. Then we have Saga the Eternal Warrior for 20 points. Once this model is reduced to zero wounds, roll a d6. On a four plus, the model regains, re re remains fighting with one wound. This has no effect against Killing Blow or other attacks that would instantly kill the model. That's not bad. 20 points to keep him alive. I could see this being used for like a wizard maybe, in case you lose your major cast or something. Then we have Saga the Glorious Hunter for 15 points. Models on foot only. After deployment, but before the first turn begins, select a single a character or monster in your opponent's army. This is the character's primary query. The character may reroll all fields to hit and to wound rolls against his primary query in close combat and with missile weapons. Not bad for 15 points, I must say. That could actually be, uh, be kind of cool there. So let's talk about our magical items. We have the Crusher at 60 points. Great weapon. Attacks with the Crusher have the lightning attacks and multiple wounds D6 special rule. That is kind of cool having lightning attacks and multiple wounds D6, but at 60 points, I don't know if it's worth it at 60 points. I would say skip it at this point. Then we have the Swaying Spear at 55. Spear Javelin, all close combat and missile attack made with a Swaying Spear. Hits Always hits on a 2-up and have Heroic Killing Blow special rule. 55 points for Heroic Killing Blow. That is pretty cool. I will admit that. At all close combat and all missile attacks. 
that's not bad. I say put this on a hero who's got multiple attacks. At 55 points, it's probably going to be your, your Jarl, but Hero King Blow is amazing, especially if you can get it off, so I would say take it. Then we have the Tear Fang at 40 points, uh, delivers his Wilder, plus one hit in close combat, and ignores armor saves and flaming attack special rules. If the Wilder does not kill at least one opponent each round of close combat he is in, he may suffer one wound, which ignores armor saves and regeneration saves as the sword strikes his Wilder instead. At 40 points, I would say skip. I mean, yeah, it's cool to have plus one to hit and ignore armor saves and flaming attacks. But, you know, everyone can also mess up as well. If you're putting this on a hero, for example, you're already gone half of your wounds. On a lord, that's a 30 of your wounds gone. Uh, skip it. So we have armor available 50 points, medium armor. This armor gains plus one wound and regen four up save rule. While that would be cool to have that one up wound, so that puts you at like wound four, four wounds for your lord level characters. And four in regen would be nice too, but almost everybody has flaming attacks these days. So maybe not as cool. Maybe not as cool. Then we have a shield as Zval, uh, Zvalin for 30 points. Uh, for each successful armor save or war save that Baron makes, all models in the unit attacking him suffer minus one of their weapon skill attacks to the end of the next turn. So cool effect, but I don't know if it's worth 30 points kind of cool. I don't know. Then we have uh, the Gleaming Torque for 40 points. It's a talisman. A model equipped with the Gleaming Torque adds plus one to their leadership. In addition, all enemy models in base contact with the wearer must pass the leadership test at the start of each close combat phase. If failed, they will be unable to attack and will be hit automatically. At 40 points, that is pretty cool. I can see you using that for your character staff. So your Ulfenar, for example, the hidden werewolf guy, I can see you putting that on him because uh, you can take a talisman up to 50 points. That would be kind of cool. I can see, I'm on the fence on it, but I can see how it could be useful though. I can really see how it could be useful. Then with the Bone of Uller for 10 points, at the start of each of your magic phases, choose any of the eight lords of battle magic and roll a d6. The result of the spell they receive it may use for the remainder of the magic phase, even if the spell would normally be unavailable to them. You know, for 10 points, not bad if you got 10 points to burn. I say, yeah, that's kind of cool. Gives you kind of like a, I can see this putting this like on a level two character, like wizard, or someone could take spells and just give them one additional spell at that point. That'd be kind of cool. I can see that one. Then Girdle of Might for 55. The Girdle of Might doubles the strength characteristic of everyone wearing it. Very cool effect. Doubling the strength of someone is awesome, but not 55 points cool, I don't think. Then we have the Hollering Horn. <laughs> the Hollering Horn for 50 points. When used only, the horn can be used at the start of any of your turns. When the horn is sounded, all Norse needles within 12 inches will move towards the nearest foe using the random movement D6 rule. In addition, all enemy units within 12 inches must make immediate panic test. I mean, it's a cool effect, but you already have counter charger really for all muster units, so is it really, really necessary? I can see you taking this for the panic, but I would say skip it just because you already have counter charge already. And then we have Raven Banner for 60 points. The unit carrying the Raven Banner causes fear in all friendly units within 12 inches of it gain immunity to fear and panic. Ooh. 60 points, though. I don't know if it's worth 60 points to cause fear, but that 12 inch to gain immunity from fear and panic, though, that could be kind of cool because it looks like this army's leadership is mediocre at best. So I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence on this one. I guess if you have 60 points to burn, then take it. But I don't know, though. I'm kind of on the fence on that one. So there we go. So that makes it the magic items and the magic for this one. So with that being said, we'll come back for the Norse army lists. All right, so now we're going to talk about the Norse army list. So let's go over that real quick. So starting off with our lord, so Eric Redaxe. Not much really cool for him. He's only got a five up armor save, four up armor save with a shield. 270 points. I say skip him. Not that great. Storm Jarl, that was that magic user we talked about earlier. 315 points. I would say he's worth it. Carol Thunderhand. Carol Thunderhand is the guy who kills dragons. 210 points. Might be a little too costly for 210 points, so it'd be dependent on him. Freerer Wolf Claw, that's the guy with the yeah, he's the king of the werekin. 235 points. I could see that if you decide to use him to make your army a beast army with like the Wolfenar and all that kind of stuff. Pretty cool there. The uh Steermere Rhymefrost, that's the giant special character. 465 points. Steermere may never be the army general. Oh boo. If Steermere is included in your army, you may take one to two frost giants as a single rare choice. So Kind of cool, still a little steep for 465 points, but if you need eight points, not a bad way to do it. Our kings cost 105 points. They can take spears, additional hand weapons, or great weapons. They can take axes, shields, and fur cloaks. They can upgrade to medium armor, very nice. They can ride a war horse, a wolf chariot for 70, 
or a War Mammoth for 325 points. Not bad. May take one Saga and or Magic items worth 100 points. Not a bad way to do so. Um, the Wolf, the War Mammoth might be kind of cool to take. I don't know about the Wolf Chariot, but the Mammoth definitely if you wanted to spend the points for it. Our Wizard, our Vitkies, costs three, uh, level 3, uh, 165 points, 35 points upgrade. You can get a Fur Cloak for 1.5 points and they take your Magic items up to 100 points. Not bad there. Then we have Floki Lost Sun. That's the guy who's running a cold one. It costs 145 points. It says no. Ch okay, he's got light armor only and a city and axe. Ah, uh, that makes sense because he's got like what? Uh, five up for being mounted, uh, four up, and a sh yeah, so you have four armor charge. It says if your army contains Floki Lost Sun, you may upgrade one unit of Norse Horseman to Norse Coleman Rider for six points per model. This unit counts as special choice. That's not bad if you want to include a unit of Coleman Riders. If not, you can skip him. Then we have Drenok Johansson for 135 points. He costs 135. I say skip this guy. Not that important. Bragley Sterlinson, that's that bard. He costs 130 points. I say auto include him. He's pretty cool. Sigrun the Proud costs 175. I say skip her. I don't I think because I don't think the shield maidens are all that great. But we'll double check here in a little bit. So 175 points. I'm on the fence on that one. Neal Trollson, that's the guy who's got two hand weapons and throwing axes. He's got the steel bane axe as well as a scrimshaw talisman for 160 points. He'd be really worth the take for that character sniping ability. Yor and Bjorn are cost 245 points. Kind of pricey, but I can see he's taking them to get that unbreakable ability as well as well as Muna Psychology. It could be very, very helpful for that 245 points. The Raven's Veard, skip that at 145. Then we have the Jarl at 60 points. They can take Spear, additional hand weapons, or great weapons for 6. They can be upgraded for Battle Standard Bearers as well. Can take Throwing Axes for 5, Shield for 2, Fur Cloak for 1, Upgrade to Medium Armor for 2, which is kind of nice. They can ride a War Horse or a Wolf Chariot for 70 points. May take 1 Saga and our Magic Items a total of 50 points. Then we have our Seers that cost 65. To upgrade to level 2 Wizard, they take 35 points, 1 point for Fur Cloak, as well as a Magic Item worth 50 points. Very cool there too. The Beast Master costs 35 points. They can take additional hand weapons, throwing axes, and bows. May wear a fur cloak, may make Adramanas with 25 points. 35 points is not bad, especially if you want to get that 8 up leadership, though. But the Valkyrie is 70 with better leadership. Okay, skip the Beast Master, take the Valkyrie. So we have the Scald. You should at least have at least one, if not the special character, too. You cost 70 points. You can take hand weapons or great weapons for 2 and 4 points apiece. May take throwing axes, can take light armor and fur cloak. May take magic items with 50. Yeah, definitely take this guy. The Valkyrie is 70. She can be armed with a spear, which is free. You can take 50, mile, uh, 50 points with magic items. Pair this lady with your snow, uh, snow trolls. Uh, that's what I would definitely recommend for her. Then we have our Ulf Jarl, which is 165 points. You can take a talisman with the 50 points. That's that character assassin werewolf monster guy. Kind of steep for 165 points, but I guess it would depend whether you want to include them in your army or not. But I can see that. So our core choice, we have Bonds, which are 5 points. Full Command is 30. They can take a Magic Standard for 25 points. They can take Spears for a point or shields with bow, replace their Shields with Bows for 2 points. And they can take Light Armor and Fur Cloaks. So not bad there. Marauders are 5 points apiece. 30 for Full Command. 25 for Magic Standard. They can take Great Weapons for 2. Armor Shields for 1. Wear Light Armor and Fur Cloaks for 1.5 points. Very cool there. Our Reavers look like the exact same thing with the Ambushers at 7 points apiece. 30 for full command, 25 for magic standard. They can take additional hand weapons for 1 point or throwing axes for 1 point. Tire unit may take light armor and fur cloaks at 1.5 points. Not bad for ambushing. And it's core too, which is kind of nice. You can make a horde, well, we, well, horde formation doesn't work in the 9th edition, but you can make a huge brick of these guys and cause all kinds of headache for enemy. And an ambushing unit like that would be very devastating. They were whalers that cost six points apiece, ten points for uh, the champion, and ten points for musician. They could be armor shields for one point. They come with javelins and hand weapons. I would say skip all that. Just take their straight up sixty. Then we have our thralls, which are our slaves. They cost three points apiece, uh, thirty points for full command, as well as they may take javelins and they may take spears, javelins or spears rather. Not bad. They can also take shields for point, half a point. I say skip the shield. I say take the javelins or the spears. It'd be kind of nice. Norse Horseman costs 13 points. If you want to upgrade into those Coleman Riders, there'd be 16 points, which is not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, they have 25 points for full command. They can take one of the following, which are spears, throwing axes, or javelins, and they could take light armor and fur cloaks. Not bad. Not bad at all. Warwolves are six points apiece, 30 points for chaff. Not bad at all there. 
our Huskarls, they come with light armor and shields. They cost 10 points apiece with full command for 30, magical standard for 50, great weapons for 2 points, medium armor for 1 point, and fur cloaks for around half point. Not bad at all to make those guys, especially since they're stubborn with great weapons. That'd be really nice to have. Berserkers cost 12 points. Yeah, these are the guys I would say skip. Uh, they do have Fur Cloak, which gives them a 6 up armor saving and shooting only. They have 30 points for full command, 50 for magic standard. They can take additional hand weapons for free or great weapons for one point apiece. The entire unit may skirmish as well. I guess they'll be kind of cool because they got minus one to hit against them in shooting, but I would say skip them. They don't have enough longevity, I don't think, to be all that great. So let's see here. Shield Maidens. Shield Maidens have just a hand weapon. Okay, so this is, why, this is why I was suspecting. So if they only have a hand weapon, it's not really worth it. They cost 7 points apiece. Uh, shield Barret, full command is 30 points. Magic Standard for 25. Can be take Javelins for 2. Light Armor and Fur Cloaks for 1.5 points. I would say skip them, as well as that special character who also leads them as well. Then we have our Hunters, which are our Scout Skirmishers. 11 points per, between units of 5 to 20. Uh, champion position is 20 points apiece. May take additional hand weapons for one point apiece and fur cloaks for half a point. Not bad for 11 points. Take these guys and use the two, I would say. The Ulfanar. So these are the guys who are the war beast guys. They cost 16 points apiece for only one wound. Yeah, definitely skip that. I would say skip these guys. They don't get standard bearers. They don't get musicians. They can be skirmishers. Great. They can be core if you take them. But 16 points for a one wounded dude with no armor? Yeah, yeah, skip that. Skin Wolves cost 38 points per model? That's fair. That's, that's not bad at all. So do that. Warwolf Chariot comes at 90 points. They can take light armor, shields, and fur cloaks for, what is that, 13 points? So 103 points for one. But they can only come in units of one. That's the only problem with those guys. Ice Wolves, they cost 37 points per model. Okay, so they're kind of up there with Skin Wolves. But they're faster. I would say, and yeah, they have Ice Attacks. If you have to pick one or the other, I would say take Ice Wolves because the Ice Attacks makes them really useful. So if it's between the two of them, between taking Skin Wolves or take Ice Wolves, take Ice Wolves. Now our rare units. Our rare beast costs 175. Yeah, we talked about this guy already. Definitely want to include that guy in the army. Snow Trolls cost 45 points apiece. Take these guys as well and pair a Valkyrie with them so that way they can protect one of your flanks. A Frost Giant costs 175 points. He could take a Shield for 6 points. Uh, giving him, uh, what is that? Just, oh, j oh, okay. Shield, or he could take additional hand weapon, or he could take a great weapon for 10. He could be equipped with medium armor. I would say medium armor with a great weapon would probably be beast on this guy. 175 points, not bad at all. Then the Cursed Etten at 210 points. So if you took the Gibberer, it would make him a 225 points. The Skilled Horn make him 235 points. I say take the Gibberer on that guy. That's pretty cool. I would definitely take one of these. I'll take one of these, one of these, a unit of this. Oh, man. Oh, man. They got so many good rare choices. It's hard to choose what you would use. You would definitely, you would definitely use up your rare choice allowance in this army. It would be very easy to just use it all up to the maximum amount. Ice Drake costs 200 points by himself. That's an auto include as well. Ooh, so that'd be like what? One, I would take a unit of this. One, two, three rare choices. Yeah, this would definitely be a Monster Mash army. And if you took the War Mammoth just by itself, it's 200, 325 points, which would be actually kind of worth it just on its own i would definitely use it as a mount for a king that'd be kind of cool to have a king riding a war mammoth i mean nothing says i king more than that which is actually kind of cool and that pretty much makes up the army lists for this one all right you guys so there you have it this is our overall review from the norska army book for warhammer 9th edition by the warhammer armies project written by matthias eliason and in my opinion, this is an excellent product. You can't beat the price, it's absolutely free. And at the same time, it would not be very difficult to source these miniatures as well. For a lot of the monsters that are mentioned in this, I would suggest using Reaper miniatures is what I would use if I could. Uh, the Bones line of miniatures especially, because the monster maybe costs 25 bucks at the most. At the same time, you can get them with the small monsters like Snow Trolls and Giants and all that kind of stuff for about five to 10 bucks, maybe 15 bucks at the most for that. So that'd be definitely easy to get. As for the Norska miniatures themselves, like for the marauders and the, and the fighters and things that one you could probably get a lot of historical miniatures from still to get those i believe there's like a lot of miniatures that still make viking mount models that you could use for those for a pretty good price and you could probably 3d print the other ones if you have access to a 3d printer 
as well. So this is not as expensive to field as other armies. And the miniatures are actually quite ready to go. Or you could just take, you know, current stuff that's out there for chaos and just use that instead for your guys. I mean, that would also work very well too. So very, very awesome. I'm kind of tempted to make a Norsko army after seeing this. So I don't know. It's actually kind of cool. Those rare choices, the hero choices, the rare choices were really, really cool in this. Some of the core units were also very cool. The units were overall were very awesome as well. And these guys are kind of like adjacent to chaos, but not exactly chaos. I mean, they're kind of like toe deep into the chaos, dipping their toe into the pool of chaos. But yeah, very, very cool army list. I like a lot of things that are involved in the side of it. I thought the rule mechanics for this is really, really cool, especially with counter charge and blood rage. Those are really, really neat rules as well. So very aggressive list with a lot of buffs for leadership as well as some really cool things on it. So yeah, very awesome job on this one. So that's going to do it for this one for our review, you guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest, and high news related to this channel. And that's good for this one, you guys. We will catch you guys in the next one. Peace out and stay classy.